Grumpy Old Geeks, a weekly talk show hosted by Brian Schulmeister and Jason DeFilippo, discussing the finer points of what went wrong on the internet and who's to blame. Welcome to Grumpy Old Geeks. I'm Jason DeFilippo. And I'm Brian Schulmeister. Uh, normally, uh, 8 a.m. recording times are, are, are kind of ideal for us, but um, I, I, there was a bit of news that broke before I woke up. A little, well, little take bit. Take your pick. <laughs> take your pick. Yeah. Um, haven't really caught up on all this. We'll see if you were up a bit before <laughs> me, Jason. So uh, oh, yeah. I, I'm, there's not enough coffee in the world right now to process <laughs> everything that I need to process. But uh, <laughs> I'll, give you, I'll give you a two second rundown here. Here's, here's what's happened. 100,000 people are dead. Uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Nobody seems to care because they're protesting because they can't get a, a, you know, a mani and a pedi and a haircut. But in the meantime, uh, there are race wars starting all across the country. And now the president of the United States, who is supposed to be our glorious leader and giving everybody guidance, decided to get in a fight with a website. So th- that brings you up to speed. Okay. Well, there we are. Let's start with a bit of frivolity first before we get Let's into all that. Let's please do it. Let's please do <laughs> it, it. In slightly happier times, i.e. 24 hours ago, um, <laughs> I was still thinking about the, the Star Trek Voyager reunion that took place on the hashtag Stars in the House YouTube channel. Um, I don't know if you've watched this yet, Jason. I have not. I have not watched this one yet. Uh, it's not bad. Um, the hosts... Okay, so it's a little bit too much Broadway for a sci-fi reunion show. The the hosts are very into the Broadway scene. Uh, I'm, I don't know too much about Broadway or them. Uh, apparently, a lot of the people that were on Star Trek Voyager have uh, spent quite a lot of time performing in Broadway. So it was more of a Broadway, hey, we all love Broadway, we're Broadway people, uh, than a sci-fi thing. Um Josh Gad with the Goonies, that was awesome. He was obviously a huge fan. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if these hosts on the show have ever even watched an episode of Star Trek. They seemed quite confused by all the terminology. Um, But still, it was nice to see the cast all together uh, talking amongst themselves, at least briefly, about Star Trek before talking more (laughs) about Broadway things. And it was really good to watch Jerry and Kate on screen together and not obviously hate each other. So that was kind of nice. All right. I will... Probably nah, not check it out. Yeah, well, <laughs> it doesn't sound like it. That was not very much a glowing review. So. It, it wasn't fantastic, and, and it's not the only time they've done it. They just got off a cruise together. I'm sure there are there are better cast uh, reunions uh, panels that are from various Star Trek conventions that have been up there. So I would watch that over over this. Um, the one right. bit of news that did come out of this is Jerry Ryan gave us a bit of an update on Picard, which is there is no update. Uh, they were scheduled uh. to have started <laughs> working on it, but obviously sets haven't even been built because the people that get together to build sets can't so it's on holding pattern okay all right well. now speaking of josh gad josh gad is back uh, and he is doing the lord's work uh the lord of the rings actually to be precise we got a trailer uh, a trailer for a reunion show uh that dropped which is actually quite amusing and this weekend as of sunday the full episode will be coming out so much like he did with the goonies he has gotten the lord of the rings cast back together not all of them uh well we don't really know but at least in the yeah. trailer we had sean astin elijah wood dominic M- monahan billy boyd orlando bloom and sir ian mckellen dropping in to uh talk and chat and uh, it, it it gave me a good smile again 24 hours ago when the world was different uh yeah. i was really looking for <laughs> forward to this now it kind of seems a bit silly no you need silly you need silly <laughs> i watched true. the i watched the trailer and i was there i just a grin ear to ear mm-hmm. so this one this one i will definitely watch yes. but uh yeah <laughs> gandalf popping in at the end was uh made my day yes and uh, we were all very excited on, on our last episode because the SpaceX first crewed mission to the ISS was being uh, was about to take off. But at roughly T minus 16 minutes, they had to scrub the launch because of weather that would have carried astronauts Robert Benkin and Douglas Hurley on a 19 hour trip to the International Space Station. Uh, they are going to shoot for the 30th or 31st as potential backup days to retry. So we will be checking that out this weekend, along with Lord of the Rings and dodging rubber bullets. Uh, I just thought it was <laughs> funny because sending bob and doug into space eh? i had not realized that it was bob and doug that were being sent. yes <laughs> unfortunately they didn't take off eh yeah eh? <laughs> yeah I, I got that movie on blu-ray i have to watch that again strange brew it was quite excellent classic yeah definitely and uh, yeah because right now we're supposed to be celebrating man's or i'm sorry not man's return to space we've been going up with uh, the americans uh return to space from our own soil but nope 
Nope. Instead, we got what we got. So, (laughs) yes, uh, hopefully tomorrow we'll bring better news. And uh, what's interesting, uh, SpaceX also got permission from the FAA to fly its Starship, that big silver thing that they're building down in Texas that doesn't look like it should ever fly. Uh, right. They're they're going to start doing hop tests with it because it's a it's a reusable spaceship. So that would be nice. Yeah, they've got one Raptor engine in it, so they're going to do a, a short hop test, and if that works, then they're going to slap in some more and mm-hmm. see what they can do. But it's only going to be uh, up to five hundred feet max, so a little farther than my drone can fly. So we'll see how that goes. But speaking of space, Space Force is out on Netflix today as we record this on Friday. So are you going to check it out? Uh, I am going to check it out. I made the mistake of at least scanning a couple review headlines and uh, not mm. looking too promising. Yeah, you shouldn't have done that. Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> well, we do have a we do have a backup plan because somebody feed Phil. Season three is out. If you need to smile, very excited about that. I'm very very happy. I was a little, my wife actually pointed out. Oh, what are they going to do? Because um, I can't remember is it his mother or her father that passed away recently. Oh, uh, I didn't know. Oh. Yeah, one one of his parents had passed away recently. But judging from the trailer, this was all shot before that. So we'll still get those wonderful wonderful end shots of of him talking <laughs> to his parents. Part of my favorite part of the show. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty funny, but uh, I think it's just going to make me sad because it's going to be a bunch of places you can't can't go to eat. Yeah, well, that, <laughs> so. that's true, but we have to live vicariously through the past. Yes, we do. <laughs> and this is interesting, and uh, it's a little bit of follow up on on our good old friends at Magic Leap. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, the CEO is out. Ronnie yeah, Abovitz well, is out. That's going to happen when your your company has produced nothing but vaporware. Yeah, yep, and I love this. Uh, this is uh, the staff memo. It says, we have closed significant new funding and have very positive momentum towards closing key strategic enterprise partnerships. So, nothing. He, uh, That's they a brought big in nothing. Some, <laughs> yeah, they brought in some more money and said, yeah, okay, thanks. Thanks for the cash. Uh, you're out. Yeah. So. They're trying to pivot, obviously, with whatever tech that they do have. Yeah, which doesn't seem to be much. Nope. In the news. So the first uh, news article in here, which seems quaint and from a previous time already, uh, was the very first uh, mention that Twitter had labeled Trump's tweets with a fact check for the first time. Now, you and I had immediately started texting each other about this and trying to figure out if it was a nothing burger or not. And my thought at the time was this can go either way. Um, Mm -hmm. they, They label him once, don't do it again. And Actually, that makes the situation worse because it, you know, just it, it's much like trying to impeach him. And now, you know, he feels yeah. he can do whatever he wants. And that would be the way that was it could go on Twitter. Or alternatively, if you do it, you have to keep doing it. And that seems to be what Jack has picked. Yeah, I was, you know, I'm like, <laughs> has Jack grown a set? It it that's what I was really so. trying to figure out. Yeah, because, you know, he put the first shot across the bow. And since the, you know, the first Trump fact check label went up, they have put up a couple hundred other fact check labels on other tweets from other people, which is good because that's what you have to do. Now, on, on um, the plus side, if you happen to be on Twitter and you are not Donald Trump, game on, because the sheer amount of fact checkers that they possibly have employed all have to be going through all of Trump's tweets now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering if they're going to retroactively go fix those. I doubt it. I tend to doubt it. Yeah. But, you know, okay, so that was the first shot across the bow. Yes. Then, then we get the executive order, <laughs> yes. which is based on an old draft that uh, they had going around. And this comes back to, oh, God, our good old friend, uh, Safe Harbor. And, yeah. you know, we've talked about that on the show a million times Look, uh, by now. And, and, uh, and, and to be honest, there, I, I somewhat agree with, with the – at least looking at Safe Harbor and, and modifying it because it has allowed platforms to get away with uh, – I, I would say murder, but we actually need to discuss murder in a real sense in a couple minutes here. So um, it, it's, it's enabled, uh, you know, platforms to use the – we're just a platform excuse for far too long. However, just abolishing it or getting rid of it or, or whatever the hell this executive order is supposed to do, which by all rights, every single lawyer in the world has said this executive order is ultimately meaningless and it's just going to start off a bunch of lawsuits and it will eventually get shot down because that's not what you do to private companies to try to regulate them. So um, somewhat meaningless, but obviously somebody got his panties in a bunch and had to do something because he lost, he got a little egg on his face. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's what's so ridiculous about this. I'm like, we have bigger problems than a website, dude. Mm -hmm. And I love that he's bitching about it on the platform that... <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, come on. Yes, the platform that is censoring him is allowing him to bitch about it. Now, let's discuss what the meaning of censoring is. Censoring is not putting a label on something and allowing it to continue to be there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that leads us to... <laughs> <laughs> this morning. Yeah. Let's talk about this morning. Let's talk about what made my eyes pop out of my head when I looked at my phone first thing before having any coffee. <laughs> yeah, uh, good old, good old rooting, tooting Trump there. I'm, <laughs> I, I keep getting him confused with Putin nowadays. Well, um, you know, yeah. you say tomato, I say <laughs> tomato. Okay, so... Yes, uh, the, the, the now, I'm sure, famous by the time this show comes out in about 14 hours. <laughs> uh, Twitter has finally put on labels saying that this tweet violates our terms of service. So, uh, the, yes, it's, uh, it, uh, what it violated Twitter's rules about glorifying violence. Yes, however, this is Twitter the has tweet. determined, yeah, however, Twitter has determined that it may be in the public's interest for the tweet to remain accessible. So you have to click through it. Right. Yeah. And, well, yeah. this is what we've wanted Jack to do um, for a long time, and he has stepped up and done it. Now, uh, it, just in case you have no idea what we're talking about, uh, Donald Trump had tweeted basically that uh, looting will lead to shooting, so straight out threatening American life. It's an interesting I, – I don't want to get too off on the Trump tangent. We should stick with the, the – technology the aspect let's, of let's this but, the Twitter but just yes. <laughs> for one second uh, i have seen a lot of crazy campaign ideas before um the campaign idea that trump seems to be following with which is uh, earlier in the week uh, cheering on the loss of american jobs just because he doesn't like the atlantic and now um threatening to kill uh, potential voters so, uh, I've, I've never seen a campaign promise quite like this before <laughs> so it's an yes, interesting, it's interesting tack to take <laughs> it is. It is. So with this new uh, new tactic from Twitter, mm -hmm. it's going to be interesting how, how Jack handles it going forward. And if he does go back and fix some of the old tweets, because there you need a lot of people to go yeah. fix some of those old tweets. Yeah. I'm guessing it's just going to be going forward. But the fact is now that uh, the gauntlet has been thrown down yes. and it we're going to see what's going to happen here. Yeah, uh, this is this is a <laughs> this is flat out going to be an interesting. Uh, it's, 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 it's a war. I mean, Twitter cannot back away from this now. They they have doubled down and they are going to apply the rules. Well, not really apply the rules because, as we've always said, if any of us did any of this, we would actually be banned and kicked yeah. off Twitter. Um, but they are going with the this is public interest sort of stuff. But they will have to apply um, uh, labels and warnings to all of his tweets moving forward. There's there's Pretty no much. avoiding it now. So and uh, yes, I even checked. Uh, they they put that same label on the tweets at uh, at White House because uh, they, I guess not the, the much White of a House, difference. <laughs> the White House retweeted it on the White House account, the official White House government run account. Uh, so. I, I don't know if you caught the other thing that the official White House government account had tweeted out today, but they it was a whiny again an interesting tactic. It was a whiny uh, thing about. One of the Khomeini's, like they, they had retweeted one of the Khomeini's tweets that also incited violence that didn't get a label. And basically, I guess that approach is this dictator is doing it. Why won't you let me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is, again, yeah. another interesting approach for an American president to be taking. It's an interesting approach for a five year old. To take. <laughs> <laughs> yes, actually, that's quite got funny a lollipop. because <laughs> I've been uh, pre pre COVID-19. I've been spending an awful lot of time trying to instill in my child that just because someone else does something doesn't mean you can. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. so now what I what I'm really fascinated by here is uh, how Zuck's going to handle this because he went on Fox News. I watched a 20 minute interview with him on Fox News talking about how, you know, he thinks that Facebook should be you know, it shouldn't be the arbiter of truth. They shouldn't fact check or anything like that and let the let the public deal with it themselves, mm -hmm. says the guy who has an algorithm that determines exactly what you can see when and where. And I, a, I, it's going I, to be interesting because there is a lot of pressure on Zuckerberg now because Twitter yeah. has stepped up his social media uh, to do this. And Zuckerberg is kind of looking like a bit of an ass uh, because he's going to apparently refuse to do it. Now, the two arguments also being made are one, uh, Facebook is irrelevant compared to Twitter, which I don't necessarily agree with. I think when it comes to Donald, it is because yeah. Donald doesn't really use the, the Facebook. Yes, but there are plenty of forces behind 
working there. And <laughs> yes. uh, yeah, I, okay. And I've got. I have to mention that the funniest thing I saw all day yesterday, and I reposted this. This was thanks to uh, Dr. David Teeter, who brought it to my attention, and it was posted originally by Chaser.com.au. So well done, Australians. Yes. <laughs> uh, social media should not fact check posts, says child molester Mark Zuckerberg. Yep, I yeah. highly recommend everybody repost that on Facebook because, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> yep. I retweeted that on Twitter. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, see, so you do that on Twitter and you're breaking the terms of service and they are uh, going to maybe label your post. <laughs> I think I actually have been shadow banned for a while because uh, my, all my tweets for a while, I'm getting, you know, 10, 20 replies, 30 replies. And then I posted a couple things and it went down to almost nothing because <laughs> I was complaining about direct TV and I had to spend two and a half hours on the phone to get to their quote unquote automated system, which wasn't automated. It was spending 90 minutes on hold and then getting told that, oh, the system that does this is down. Thank you so much, direct TV. <laughs> <sighs> anyway, moving on. Well, now, what's what's brought about a lot of the ire here are certainly what uh, some of the defenses are for Trump and, and not being labeled and things like that is that for, for years now, basically since Trump has been in office, uh, conservatives have been crying, crying foul and saying that they are uh, being um, – th there is an anti-conservative bias in social media. Now, th right. this is this is their marching orders. This is part of their talking points. This is something that they say all the time. And uh, basically, uh, <laughs> the very day that this all started, uh, a U.S. appeals court in Washington, D.C. has dismissed a lawsuit accusing top tech companies of silencing conservative voices. Uh, this was filed in 2018 by the nonprofit Freedom Watch with mm -hmm. a side of freedom fries and right-wing <laughs> gadfly laura loomer the suit accused apple facebook twitter and google of stifling first amendment rights as you can imagine it is somewhat unclear about how apple would be involved in that as they have no social media of any note but mm -hmm. you know throw them into the lawsuit as well because they're big tech uh and yeah the government uh, uh the the district judge trevor mcfadden basically said threw this out and said nope not happening. Uh, they failed to back up any claim that the companies were state actors involved with the regulation of free speech, basically just saying they're platforms. <laughs> so uh, they, they can do what they want. And frankly, we don't see it either. And uh, it is worth pointing out that this legal ruling comes after a number of well-documented studies of social media that have already proven that there is no anti-conservative bias whatsoever. So I've included a link in our notes. The myth of social media anti-conservative bias refuses to die. Uh, this is by the, oh, sorry, I can't remember quite the name of the organization here. Uh, the Columbia Journalism Review. So that sounds mm. pretty legit to me. Um, <laughs> despite an almost total lack of evidence to support the theory, alt-right groups and mainstream conservatives alike, including the ones that currently occupy the White House, continue to promote the idea that Facebook, Twitter, and Google are somewhat, somehow biased against them. We have found this to be not true. It just reminds me of the other thing that finally it... it you know, uh, with all this stuff going on, I, it's dawned on me that we haven't heard in a long time that Facebook's listening to me and send, sending me ads because <laughs> that refused to die for a long time. Why, why won't this one just uh, go along with that one? Oh, wait. Yeah. Uh, never mind. Yeah. <laughs> I know. <never> mind. <laughs> Now, to kind of transition back to our normal bread and butter, uh, i.e. morons in the tech world, we'll move away from, from the Twitter Wasn't fight for now. Wasn't that exactly what we were just talking uh, about? That's a good point. Okay, non-politically charged morons. Non-political morons in the tech world, yes. The ones that keep our numbers up instead of going down, Jason. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. So this is a great story that I that I found, and I really, it, it belongs in Moron of the Week here. I, I, the business models that come out of Silicon Valley are just beyond me. Uh, Emmanuel Bamfo is the co-founder and CEO of Globe, a year-old six-person startup that connects customers with rooms in people's mostly urban homes. Think Airbnb, except that Globe isn't for users looking for days or months-long stays, but instead for a day break. Yes, okay. it's a platform and a company that will put you in somebody else's room, spare room in their house for a couple hours. Oh, so they should have just called this app Notel Motel. Right. Because you know that that's what it's going to be used for. Hookups. <laughs> so get this uh, again, because this is just the way work, things work. Globe evolved from an earlier company called Recharge that tried convincing hotels to let its customers rent their rooms by the hours and even minute, your Notel Motel, <laughs> and had raised... $10 million in funding for that concept. 
Okay, you know what? Whoever gave them $10 million deserves to lose it because they're just stupid. Now, I mean, like, obviously, on. hotels push back on this idea even pre-COVID-19 because the idea of cleaning their rooms so frequently would basically not make any financial sense for them. So they went into the popular accelerator program, Y Combinator, and came up oh, with God. a brilliant pivot of instead of using hotels, <laughs> let's just use people's houses. Oh, God. Now, against all odds, they have been growing slow but steady with more than 10,000 hosts around the world signing up to rent out rooms in their homes, mostly serial killers, one would imagine. Yes. And then came COVID-19. So obviously this idea kind of went away, sort of, because people continued to actually do it a very small amount. Instead of giving up, they began to position Globe as a platform for people needing escape from home quarantines. Escaping from quarantine. Quarantines is their business model now. <laughs> this shit just you cannot itself. <laughs> make this shit up. So they say Globe can help individuals find that quiet place to make calls away from roommates and children and infecting other people. It involves it offers a reprieve from loved ones for a much needed hour or two. It can even help those in desperate straits to find better bandwidth. Really, during a pandemic. <laughs> So mostly, they're, they're mostly, of course, San Fran based and San Francisco sent them a letter last week noting that the company's hourly rental business appears to violate the shelter in place order. You think? Yep. Yeah. So it said, uh, basically, you've got to stop doing this and they are prepared to take action. It has warned Globe that if it doesn't immediately halt its business, the startup and its founders uh, risk fine imprisonment or both pursuant to San Francisco Administrative Code Section 7.17B and California Penal Code Section 148. So basically it's saying you are a menace to public health. Your business model breaks the rules that we have set down and we will fine you and maybe even put you in jail. So this is somewhat unsurprising. Uh, because, you know, <laughs> laws. And uh, there you go. And Banfo, who says he was shocked by the city's letter, is engaging in a game of chicken. He says that while Globe works on an official response, one that it will send by Tuesday of this coming week, the company is continuing to make its service available. He says that Globe doesn't want to focus on regulations, fines, and threats of jail time. We want instead to elevate this discourse around solutions. You don't Somebody's want to focus on the laws <laughs> that have shut you down, and you want to elevate the discourse while continuing to run your illegal company somebody has been drinking too much uber kool-aid uh -huh. because <laughs> this is the fuck it we're gonna do what we want response yeah i'm pretty sure that this uh this even even uber wouldn't have tried to fight this one no so yeah. good luck with that globe i hope good the city luck. shuts you down yes and instagram is in the news because they're finally going to start sharing revenue with creators for the first time Sort of. <laughs> sort of. Sort of. Not kind of weird in a sort of weird way. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Next week, they're going to start showing ads on IGTV for only about 200 approved English speaking creator partners. Uh, and the ads are just going to be from a handful of partners. And yeah. all the videos are going to be uh, checked by human reviews. So everything has to go through that. And they hope in the future that they will be able to have a combination of human and software uh, reviewing so that they can, you know, release the product in a wider way. And they're only going to be sharing 55% with creators, okay. uh, which they said is industry standard. And that's what you get if you're on Facebook watch, which nobody watched. And I don't think that many people watch IGTV. Either, I don't think that but... <laughs> many people watch IGTV. I mean, uh, you know, we're old, who knows, but uh, I don't think IGTV's reach is all that great. The thing I found interesting about this, and I do like this but the human reviewing thing probably won't stick around for too long it, it, it's a good thing i like it and this is an interesting and smart way to get around the whole um political ads thing because they're basically not going to do any political ads and they're going to review everything and they have select ad partners um it's it's great but it's obviously not sustainable they want to open this up to everything to make all the monies right i mean you have to have a broad platform if it's really going to work and you have to open it up <laughs> to everybody to make money on it but mm -hmm. uh you know, it's a it's this it's a test case. Yep. It's a test case to see if they can do it and if people are gonna be willing to actually or if I mean if the ads even work on Instagram. But Yeah, who knows? Yeah. I mean, because you can advertise on Instagram now. All that is, you know, you can go I I've, I've I've seen so many dicks in ads on Instagram, it's ridiculous, as it would say. Really? And You're, what what are you looking at to get that in your algorithm? Hell if I know, man. It's, <laughs> it's, Instagram's supposed to be a clean platform, but you get every now and again you get a bunch of boner pills or 
penis extensions well, in there. Hold on and it's a like, second. Let, let's t- let me let me just talk for a second about the concept that Instagram is supposed to be a clean pat- platform when ninety nine percent of the influencers are girls in tiny tiny bikinis showing their boobs. Right. No nipples though. No, no nipples, nipples. No that's genitals. True. That's you know <laughs> they've they've got their nipple algorithm locked. That's true. Yeah. So what else? Come on, guys. All right. Apple's in the news and for uh, buying yet another AI startup. This time to improve series performance, the company has confirmed to Bloomberg that it recently acquired Inductive, a Waterloo, Ontario, Canada-based company that uses AI to correct data, which in turn improves machine learning. So basically, it's an AI uh, data cleaning machine. So All right. So uh, this is a move to uh, attempt to compete uh, with, obviously, Amazon and Google, whose voice <laughs> recognition <else>. is considerably <laughs> better than Siri. So I, I welcome this. Because, uh, well, let's be honest. I only I have, I use Siri on my watch when I'm barbecuing to set time. That's about it. That's that's really about <laughs> it. My roommate uses it all the time, and just there's there's never anything good that comes back from it. Yeah. This is what I found on the web. That's yes. not what I. Asked. Thanks. That's <laughs> like, not useful. We consider uh, that a horrific result if we get that from our other ladies in the tube. Exactly. I'm like, okay, what time does Target open? And you ask Amazon or Google that, and it's like, oh, hey, the one closest to you, because we know where you're at, opens in about 12 minutes. So get your butt on over there. <laughs> Siri's like, uh, you are you looking for Target practice? What is yes, exactly. No idea. Siri is horrific. So hopefully they'll fix that. Yep. And speaking of things that are horrific, Palantir, uh, our favorite... Uh, Private uh, search company and uh, spooky yeah. company. Spooky the company. The biggest spooky company. Well, over at Axios, they had an interview with the CEO, Alex Karp. And uh, so apparently they're thinking of leaving Silicon Valley because of the monoculture, and they may leave California altogether. And I thought this quote was pretty funny for a company that's supposed to know everything about everyone and everywhere in the world. Mm-hmm. <laughs> We haven't picked a place yet, but it's going to be closer to the East Coast than the West Coast. If I had to guess, I would guess something like Colorado. (laughs) Get that man a map. Wow. (laughs) Maybe they need that uh, data cleaning uh, AI over there because uh, their maps are all messed up. They must be using Siri. Well, here's the thing. Uh, He works from a barn in New Hampshire. He says, I've been distanced from Silicon Valley for the last 15 years, and so I'm used to being social distanced in the Valley, and now social distancing has become a way of life. The world would be a better place if this company socially distanced from the world. Yeah, yeah. Can we put them on an island somewhere that maybe gets sunk from global warming? Look, this this assumes an awful lot. This assumes that their employees that one assumes they somewhat value would want to move, which they probably don't. Uh, And go ahead, leave. I'm I'm tired of these companies. You want to bitch? Leave. Go. Yeah. Well, I mean, they say that they want to leave because, you know, a lot of their employees are pissed off at them because of signing contracts with, you know, ICE and, you know, shady government organizations. And they think that it's the it's because of the culture in Silicon Valley that people are are mad at them. It's like, no, because human beings are mad at you because you're 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 sleazy. Yep. So <laughs> it's like <laughs> you can go to Colorado and I, I don't know if you've been to Colorado, dude, but there's a lot of hippies out there that don't like don't that like, don't like big tech. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. And uh, to finally put a, a note on the rich get richer, Elon Musk has reached his first Tesla compensation award worth nearly $800 million. Okay. It's crazy. They uh, they eclipsed $20 billion in total revenue over the last four quarters in a market cap of more than $100 billion. And uh, this is a, a you know, a first in a series of milestones, which could net him, you know, a couple more billion dollars down the line. So... Uh, it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, he can buy, was it 1.60, uh, 1.69 million shares, uh, of, of the stock, but he can get them at a strike price of $350 a share. But the stock right now is trading at about a hundred or $800 right. in, the, in the range of $800. So right there, if he just exercises those options, that is a juicy profit. Well, look, Elon Musk is basically the industrialist version of Donald Trump right now. Now, let me explain that. Not, not in all ways. Uh, Elon <laughs> Musk explain. is actually, let me explain. Elon Musk is actually smart. <laughs> And Elon Musk actually (laughs) makes money as opposed to Donald Trump. But the way he is like Donald Trump is basically Twitter based in that he can say whatever he wants, do whatever he wants, lie about whatever he wants, not produce what he said he was going to produce. And everybody still loves him and believes him. It's amazing. Yeah. Whatever happened with him not being allowed to use Twitter for a while because of the uh, 
uh, that, that crap he said about. I can't yeah. even remember. It, it, well, there have been so many Elon Musk Twitter scandals that I, I, they all kind of blend together. Again, that, like, that, that was all before Jack grew balls. Yeah, that's true. Well, we, let, let's see. I mean, he's got... He's starting to get a little peach fuzz down there. Let's see if he actually grows in a, a full set. Yeah, I'm sure you'll see it in your ads on Instagram. I <laughs> <That> will. <laughs> Today's episode is sponsored by Private Internet Access, America's number one virtual private network, also known as a VPN. Even if you use incognito mode, your internet service provider is storing your browsing data and many times even selling it. But Private Internet Access, or PIA, can help. PIA encrypts and reroutes your internet traffic through one of its own servers, hiding your data from your internet service provider or network admin. And with servers in over 75 countries, you can get unrestricted access to geoblock content around the world. PIA comes with an easy-to-use app and browser extensions for all devices, a rock-solid privacy policy, open-source security, advanced customization settings, and it was just ranked the fastest VPN in the world by PCMag. If you sign up with PIA right now, you can take advantage of a special deal only for GOG listeners. By using our link, gog.show slash VPN, you can get complete digital privacy for less than $2 a month and four extra months for free, which means only $1.98 a month and up to 83% off. That's so much more inexpensive than virtually every other VPN on the market. And if you get it right now, you can take PIA's 30-day risk-free challenge. You can try it out for 30 days and see if you like it. If not, just return it for a full refund. So go to GOG.show slash VPN and try out the best VPN on the planet completely risk-free. That's GOG.show slash VPN. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Hey, hey. I'm Maga Robbie and I play Bobby. And I'm Ryan Gosling and I play Ken. Max is now the exclusive streaming home of Barbie. So cool. And the Max with Ads plan is included with your Cricut $60 unlimited plan at no additional cost. Log in with your Cricut username and password to experience Max on all your favorite devices. This is the best day ever. It is the best day ever. Don't miss Barbie now streaming on Max. Phone plan streams in standard definition. Programming subject to change. These terms and restrictions apply. See CricutWireless.com for details. Ups and doodads. So something else fun happened with our ladies in the tube this week. My son has discovered he can make our Amazon Echoes fart. Oh, great. And uh, <laughs> yes, that, that was hours of wondrous fun for him. On the plus side, I was able to leave the room and he just sat there and kept it going. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I left the room, I realized that I had forgotten to turn off uh, <laughs> in uh, invoice purchasing. And uh, thanks, Amazon, for offering up the Extreme Fart add-on pack as part of the process of going through and asking for farts. Thanks. Oh, nice. So you could, it actually it has a fart upsell built into the fart app. It does. For one ninety nine. <laughs> you can get Big Fart, which my son did. So I'm now the proud owner of that. Link in the show notes. You know, <laughs> all this shit that we're talking about and when this whole thing started with just, you know, the ladies in the tubes and then uh, it, it, oh God, it just everything is still trending towards idiocracy we're in that in between state when when covid-19 hit we're like okay this could be a, a fantastic societal reboot the the you know the atmosphere is clearing up people are driving less less fossil fuels blah 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 people are working from home more and it's going to change the way the world works and then everything falls apart again and the human's true nature comes out and i just you know i i was really hoping for that utopia to come out of it but you know it's pretty easy just farewell utopia it's not coming we, no it, it's we, not <laughs> no this is not going to end up in star trek land and i do want to so, say as a note i'm I'm quite annoyed at amazon's whole process and procedure for for the upsells with the ladies in the tube because uh you know if i'm trying to play some music and say i can't find it on spotify or whatever then i basically get a almost two minute red ad about uh upselling to amazon music i don't want that and you can't get out of it mm. it's really annoying like you got to cut down these sales pitches people do i need an elevator pitch at best <laughs> for these upsells. <laughs> oh, man. So HBO Max came out this week. Mm -hmm. Much to the confusion of everybody. Yeah, there's <laughs> now three different HBO streaming services. Right. There's HBO Go. And mm -hmm. that's if you have HBO as part of your cable package and you want to watch it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. There's HBO Now. If you don't have cable and want to watch HBO, which is what I had, and now there's HBO Max, which is the entire HBO catalog and Warner Media content. And... I went with HBO Max. Give it a okay. shot. It's uh, 
a couple bucks more. Actually, no, it was the same price. It was maybe a dollar more a month. That would not be the same price. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I couldn't remember if it was the same or not. I, <laughs> okay. Because it, it flashed by so fast, and I was trying to remember what I paid. For HBO Now, I was thinking I was paying fourteen ninety nine, and I think right. Max is the same. But um, so I went and checked it out, and there's definitely a lot more stuff on there. Mm-hmm. And there's there's a really cool section. Well, you've got the um, uh, was the Studio Ghibli stuff on there. All of those movies, right. which is great because I've never seen most of them. I've only seen a couple of them, and I want to go back and watch them because they're they're fantastic movies. But I just never had you know access or the the wherewithal to go out and find them. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm going to try and watch more of those and get through those because uh, they're they're fantastic. There's a lot of classic movies on there that I've always wanted to see. So I'm going to check those out too. So I'm I'm still digging into it, but trying to figure this stuff out is like, okay, what am I getting here that I wasn't getting before? And uh, fortunately, over at TechCrunch, they did a really nice write-up. It's called Netflix, Disney Plus, or HBO Max, the best streaming service for your watching habits. And it's a nice breakdown of which service is best for what you want to watch. I recommend everybody check it out. And of course, for kids, Disney Plus, no, no brainer yep. on that yep. one. Yep. Um, and uh, HBO Max actually won a lot of the categories. So... It's a pretty um, deep media catalog when you got when you get Warner involved. So, yeah, it really is. It really is. So, uh, I really don't need to go back and watch the Fresh Prince of Bel Air from the beginning, though. I, <laughs> I think I can skip that one. Um, but yeah, uh, it, so far so good. And uh, the uh, the interesting thing is trying to get it uh, updated on Roku is impossible. I can't. Find, there's no HBO Max app on the Roku yet. They said there's one, but I can't find it anywhere. But it works on my iPad and my computer, and you can watch it over the web and stuff like that. Right. So waiting on that. Now, finally, in apps and doodad news, I saw this come across my desk this morning. Tidal announces Dolby Atmos support for soundbars and set-top boxes, Apple TV included. Mm. And, of course, the first thing I said was, Title still a thing? Well, there was a lot of money pumped in title a long time ago. <laughs> well, there was a magic leap too. <laughs> yep, that's true. Uh, yeah, I'm a little surprised the title is still actually somewhat involved in the streaming wars, but I, I guess they're not really. They're just they're just there. I mean, <laughs> I don't know anybody that has a title account that doesn't have it for free because they work on basically deals for title. Security? Ha! Welcome to COVID Corner with Dave Bittner. Dave is the host of the CyberWire podcast. Dave is also the host of the social engineering podcast Hacking Humans with Joe Kerrigan, as well as the co-host of Caveat with Ben Yellen, where they discuss law and policy as well as surveillance and privacy. I thought we should just pull the veil away and say, yeah, security's <laughs> kind of on hold for a little bit. Mm. <laughs> and I, I like COVID Corner with Dave Bittner. It sounds, yeah. sounds Saturday Night Live-esque. Yeah. Actually, I was more thinking, uh, you know, CBS early Sunday morning programs. It could be that too. The old, yes. the old school ones. <laughs> what was yes. the, who was it? Was it Charles Corral? Who yes, Charles drive Corral. around in, in his uh, in his RV, and uh, <laughs> turns out that he was not only touring the country, but he had basically a a, a lover in every town. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that story? I do. It was excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good old Charles Corral. Uh, Something you need yeah. to tell us, Dave. <laughs> no, not yet. No, okay. actually, um, uh, Joe Kerrigan's the one with the RV. He's oh. uh, so I don't know. I don't know what's up, but uh, I don't think he drives around in it. So <laughs> you know, just him and his wife Lisa and his family. But uh, no, <laughs> not not my uh, not my thing. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, guys well, are not doing well today. Uh, nobody is. Yeah. <laughs> get in the line dude this, well this is actually one of those rare occasions where neither uh neither right nor left neither conservative nor liberal i, I don't think is doing too well today um yeah mm. uh, the whole country not doing so well today yeah yeah it's tough i was uh speaking to someone else i was interviewing today uh, uh just at uh if if i'm feeling this way this this level of um I don't know what you call it anxiety angst uh, distress all that sort of stuff uh and with all the advantages that I have you know being a middle-aged white upper middle class man I can only imagine what it's like for folks who don't have that long list of you know basically every privilege checkbox there is <laughs> uh the the how it, it must be even worse for them and I I don't even know that I have the right to I, I guess it's something I deal with is do is who who am i to complain right uh from from many of the 
Twitter threads that I've read and, and the, uh, you know, opinion pieces that have come out in the last 24 hours, uh, I believe everybody is telling us that this is how they feel all the time. So welcome. <laughs> welcome to the party, guys. <laughs> yeah. 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 I tell you well, what, you know, we haven't given many, many tips lately on how to get through the, the lockdown and everything that we've been going through and all this stuff. I have found that cleaning my inbox has become kind of my Zen thing at night. I've gotten I've gotten down from 650 emails down to only 70 now. And it hmm. uh, leaves me with a wonderful sense of satisfaction and accomplishment, even though I know it is the dumbest thing in the world to do. Mm. But... <laughs> Nothing has actually gotten accomplished except I've made a number go away, but uh, it has uh, it has definitely been something that I can find uh, I, I can hang my hat on at the end of the day before I go to bed and say I did something today. It's it's yeah. good to have goals. It is. <laughs> yeah, I'm reminded goals. of uh, I think there was I can't remember specifically who it was. It was a woman who's a famous writer, and she said, um, "I hate writing. I love having written." And yes. that's how I feel about going through my email. I really hate email and I hate going through email. And so much of my email is um, uh, just uh, pitches from PR folks who want to get their folks on our show, yeah. which is great. And that's necessary. And, you know, the the ones who do a good job, I appreciate they make my life easier. But, you know, the ones who do a good job are... Few, few and, and far, far between. between. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We so, kind of I mean, <laughs> we we kind of have a stock email response saying you have obviously not even listened to our show. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. Do you even know what we do here? And so, yeah. Uh, I used to get uh, about to... two hundred of those a week when I when I was doing booking for Jordan Harbinger's show. So I know I know oh, what you're yeah. going through. At there least two hundred a week. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, I, I I often procrastinate and wait till the end of the day to uh, to clear out my email inbox and <laughs> to crush uh, the spirits of those people who are just looking to get a little airtime. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, I always feel good when it's done. You're right; it, it is a, a feeling of accomplishment, and there's a, a little bit of cleansing that goes on with that. But when I look at it and I see that long list, I'm just like, oh god, god. <laughs> I, I'm my email. I'm way too OCD to have. Uh, basically an inbox like I, I have folders that i move things to that i know not to deal with i am uh i'm way too heavy-handed with the delete particularly since quarantine has started I, I i've probably deleted emails that i should have responded to but i just couldn't be bothered and uh i saw somebody on twitter had posted a screenshot of half a million unanswered emails or unopened <laughs> emails and it literally gave me such anxiety i had to like take a nap i i can't i couldn't it must well, have been so, Tim Ferriss' right. inbox. <laughs> but, but, but I think that brings me to another interesting point. So here's a question for the two of you. When you go on vacation, are you someone who unplugs and deals with the avalanche of email when you get back? Or are you someone who checks as you go to prevent that avalanche from building up? What's a vacation? <laughs> yeah, you, you you are speaking to two people that have run their own shows, uh, run their own companies and been contractors for 20 plus years. So yeah, yeah. there's no such thing. I, I, I would take my laptop with me on vacation so I can do work as needed. I have my phone. I check my emails. Now, since having a child that has changed slightly, I still bring everything with me to do work. But uh you know, if we're going down to the pool and having family time, then the phone stays home or in the hotel. Mm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, as yeah. a podcaster for seven and a half years that runs shows that happen to come out every single week, you know, it was five years before I took my last vacation. And uh, it was just one of those things where it's like, OK, autoresponder. And, and it said anything that you send me in between these dates will not be viewed. And I just <laughs> deleted them. Yeah. And said, mm -hmm. just just write me back after I'm back, because generally the problem that you're emailing me about right now, you will have solved by the time I get back and there will be no <laughs> need for me to talk to you. Yeah. Right. I mean, it became a running joke with my wife that uh, was particularly when I was still working heavily within the music industry, that as soon as I announced to all my clients that I would be taking a vacation, uh, emergencies would immediately occur. And that's, oh, yes. Yeah. That was yeah. always the truth of it. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I try. I, I even today I try to guard my weekends as much as possible to not check email and Slack and so forth. I, I feel like I, we run at such a, a, a high level of intensity throughout the week that I just need to be able to 
slow down on the weekends a little well, bit. Well, one of the one of the hopes, at least, of this quarantine and this pandemic, the, the silver linings that I've seen repeatedly in articles, especially about the tech industry, is that hopefully we will be able to claw back some sense of time off. Um, but from what I see from the people that I know, um, it kind of goes two ways: either you've been furloughed or fired, and you have no work, or your workload is insane right now and um, mm-hmm. yeah and especially you know the, the 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 problems of trying to to work from home if you have family or other distractions are not helping because it, it you're working at you know quarter speed half speed whatever just because of the realities of the situation and your work is piling up like i know my wife has been working on weekends which she never used to really have to do unless right. there was an important deal coming through it's just the workload is for those who still employed the workload is incredible Well, and I remember, too, when I moved uh, the business out of the house and into a proper office, I noticed a real change in a lot of my clients' attitude towards their ability to interrupt me at any any time of the day. Mm -hmm. Just by having an office outside of the house, somehow in in their mind, I think that established the fact that I wasn't just at home. I couldn't just walk downstairs, you know, to the Mm -hmm. edit room that was in my basement or, you know, like you have, Jason, just, well, I mean, it's right there out out in the garage, right? I mean, what... What's keeping you from it? Just, can't you just make that quick change for me? You know. Well, I, I think we That's discussed it. that. That's it. We, we discussed situations like that a bit when we did our big work from home uh, kind of wrap ups and things of that nature. Which is, I mean, one of the things that I had always attempted to do was make sure, whenever possible, that no client knows that I actually worked from home. That, mm. that I actually pretended to have an office. And the biggest thing that that I think Jason and I both tried to do back in the early days was to create a fake office persona. So you have a staff email account that things go through that isn't your name. Uh, So, you know, kind of keep that mirage going that you are not working from home and available 24 seven. And there are layers of people to get to before they get to you. Yeah. That's one of the things I wonder about with, uh, with everybody shifting to work from home is how that shift is going to fuzz the lines even more between work time and home time. And, you know, be careful what you ask for. Yeah, that that's one of the real downsides of working from home, and and I know a lot of people are are maybe it's just bots out there that are applauding this and saying this is the best thing ever. But uh, I know it's not, it's especially when whole families are working from home. That's a that's a completely different story. So um, the idea that you have a separation, it's very hard psychologically to to do that. The separation of work and home when you're in the same space all day mm-hmm. long. It yeah. takes a lot of discipline and a lot of training for your clients. Like mm-hmm. now everybody knows that at uh, two o'clock office is closed. White claws know? are popping. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. I did. I, I, those two generally don't have to be <laughs> the same time, but they know? do tend to dovetail, don't they? <laughs> you know, th- there might be a little creep going on. There might be a little overlap, but mm. I have found that also, um, I don't do back and forth with people anymore when it comes to scheduling. I use a service to do yes. to use my scheduling. I use Calendly and I'm like yep. I even have it in the footer of my email. I'm like if you'd like to book some time with me, just click on this link and they in there are multiple options for time and my availability and that way I'm not playing the the dumb game of, you know, trying to do tag with that. And that helps yes. a lot. It is so worth the money to do yes, something that like is that. Yes, that is I agree that we I use the same thing for scheduling folks uh, for interviews and so forth and boy is that a lifestyle upgrade if you're not <laughs> using something like that. Uh, Mm -hmm. And we use Calendly as well. Uh, There are a lot of them out there, but that uh, you will get you will get time back in your life, and uh, it's a oh. it's a really really good tool. Dude, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It's like it, it, it is. <laughs> I've got you know I I got the paid service, so I can link like you know all of my calendars from all my different accounts, so they all like overlap. You don't have to worry about oh man, I forgot I was booked on this other calendar this time. It's just you you stop having to think about it, and when you realize how much you did think about it before. And how much time you spent on it before that reclaim time. It's just, I mean, in just the, the, you know, the psychic load that it takes off. It is so nice. I, I've never yeah. had to book quite as much as you guys had, but I stumbled across my own super low tech version of that over the, you know, 20 years of trying to deal with and schedule calls with clients and things of that nature, which was always, I would um, always respond with just two options. That's it. I would look at my calendar. And I'm going to say, you could have Thursday at three or you can have Wednesday at two pick. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Well, 
you know, uh, I know you guys spoke earlier in the show about uh, the executive order from the president. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I don't want to rehash that. Uh, but I do want to just mention that uh, we did send up the bat signal uh, to Ben Yellen on the CyberWire today. So if you look at Friday's episode of the CyberWire, Ben and I have a conversation where he unpacks the whole executive order from the position of someone who actually knows about things like the law. Which, yeah, see, uh, that that is what was lacking from our discussion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Any sense so, of credibility whatsoever was totally lacking from ours. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Ben, of course, is actually a, a lawyer and a law professor and all that sort of good stuff. So uh, the summary version from him is that this is really just a political statement. It has no it, – it, it is uh, – Ridiculous to the point of being nonsensical when it comes to the way it's put together and the legal things it tries to do and the oh. various agencies and organizations it calls upon to do things that, that are things that those agencies cannot do or do not do. So um, not a whole lot to see here, according to Ben. But uh, check out check check out his version of it if you're interested uh, over on Friday's CyberWire. So even with no real knowledge, we actually nailed it. Yeah, pretty much. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I guess it probably wasn't that hard to uh, come down on the right side of this one and and just guessing based on past history. But uh, exactly. (sighs) Boy, just, yeah, pile it on. Hell of a week, right? Hell of a week. Hell of a week. Yeah, Yeah. uh, you know, as we've talked a lot in in our little COVID corner now about uh, kind of the ups and downs and how the emotions go. And, and I had had a pretty good week the previous week and I kind of knew it was coming and I was sliding into um, ennui and, and all the related feelings that we get even before all of this happened. And, and boy, hey, I'm going to need, maybe I need some white claws today. <laughs> Wait for the wheel, Brian. Wait for the wheel. It was a, it was a fantastic episode of Farscape and uh, they, they, they had that term in it and I, I've looked it up since then and it's, a, it's an old term and it's just like, you know, sometimes you're at the top of the wheel and sometimes you're in the mud, but the wheel always goes round. So just wait for the wheel and it'll come back around. And if you're at the top, here comes the mud. <laughs> so... <laughs> Oh. oh, and I did forget, I, I, uh, since we do this out of order, I was meant to put this in the closing shout outs. My friend Gigi Edgley, she did a short film called Hashtag back in the day, and uh, it is now available on the uh, sci-fi platform Dust. So I will throw a link to that in the show notes, too, because we hmm. love Gigi. And it was, uh, I was actually, it was a uh, crowdfunded short film that I actually was a, uh, a patron for. So oh, nice. I recommend that. Yeah. So Nice. Uh, little, I see you little... put a couple of stories in the show notes here. What do we want to cover today? Nah. <laughs> <laughs> As I was saying to Jason earlier in the show, it's like it felt like everything that we put in our show notes from yesterday felt so bizarrely from a different world from this morning. <clears throat> um, mm-hmm. That's why I, I didn't I think... put summaries in because I knew everything was going to change. I'm like, okay, this is just a starting point for people who want to follow the follow the link trail in the show notes. <laughs> yeah, and I can't help but feel that when this comes out tomorrow, everything will have, of course, changed again because everything is going so quickly. But let's at least do the the listener feedback question. And we can skip the other ones and just talk about our feelings as we do in COVID Corner. Um, <laughs> okay. Highlander writes in, uh, love your show. Got all your episodes downloaded to my computer. Can you comment on the latest telephone scam? Scammers from a fake service Canada call you, threaten arrest and prosecution, then demand payment in Bitcoin. Are you receiving something similar? Um, I can say I have not gotten any of these calls. Uh, and my wife actually still has a Canadian cell phone and she has not gotten any of these calls either. So I don't know if this is maybe Canadian specific or if it's, uh, everywhere. I don't know why anybody in the U S would take a call from service Canada. So I'm assuming Highlander might be Canadian here. Yeah. I mean, the scam, the style of scam itself is pretty widespread. Um, so I suspect, First of all, this is probably coming from somewhere overseas and they're just dialing it in for whoever they know that they're calling. So if they're calling Canadians, they're uh, pretending to be from a Canadian agency. If they're calling people in the U.S., uh, we'll hear a lot. Uh, they pretend to be from the FBI, actually. That's the, I think, the yeah, most popular I've, one. Yeah, I've gotten those a few times. Yeah, I've gotten the yeah. FBI. I've gotten the IRS. And mm. since I have a 415 phone number, which is, you know, uh, San Francisco-based, most of my spam now is in Chinese because they go after Chinese immigrants mm-hmm. and and threaten oh, them with deportation. And the uh, like. that's not limited to just San Francisco. That's uh, all of LA gets that as well. I get those two to three times a day. 
Interesting. Interesting. Huh. A lot of Chinese here too, Jason. <laughs> well, I, I'm just I put the I, I've been getting them for years, so I thought it was just a thing in in San Francisco, all four one five based, because the numbers yeah. come from four one fives. That's their trick to make you try and pick it up. Yeah. So the the ones you get in Chinese from L A are they using L A area codes? Yeah, two one three or three one zero mostly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've noticed also that they they will use your prefix. Uh, yes, not yep. just the area code. They'll use your mm-hmm. prefix to try to trick you into answering. Yes, to to make you think that it's one of your neighbors with the very small understanding that in major cities none of us want to or know our neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I have never had somebody with the same prefix as me ever, ever, ever. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Not not since I was a child. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. All right. Yeah. Especially since cell phones came along, because cell phones, at least in L.A., the cell phone mapping was all over the place. So, you know, my mm-hmm. my my prefix, like, I don't know anybody that has it, even people that are live within Santa Monica. So. Yeah, and my prefix usually is picked because I could spell a good word with the whole number. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> right, you're that guy. <laughs> yeah, of course he is. Come on, Well, Dave. I was back in the day. <laughs> yeah. Everybody yeah. was. As soon as you got the option to do Call that, you sit there and look. 415, fuck you. <laughs> I had right. like three two three punk for a long time, so of course I'm going to keep okay. that. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. So, I mean, that was that was in the early '90s when AT and T let you go to their website and scroll through the numbers and pick your numbers, and it was just like we'd sit there with the uh, uh, the the in one page you'd have that, and then in the other page you'd have the generator, the number generator, script. Yeah. yeah, the Perl script that would <laughs> make words for you. You tried to figure it out. Yeah, oh, simpler right. times in tech. It was fun. I mean, that was it, it that was. was back when it was neat. Yes, it was. <laughs> now I, actually, I liked it. <laughs> I, I do want to ask you a question, Dave, and I'm assuming that no news is bad news and there was nothing in the show notes. How's the uh, Stormtrooper outfit front looking? Not No uh, no movement there. Mm-hmm. Nothing nothing new. I'm a little um, disappointed actually, in our that's, listeners. That's, well, yeah. it's, I, I, I shouldn't say that. One, I did get uh, a, a note from someone. Let me look up who it is here. Uh, a kind note from someone who is uh, going to be looking into the possibility. Uh, actually, this is someone who, uh, someone named Richard, who is with the um, the Rebel Legion in San Francisco, which is the good guy version of the 501st. And he has uh, offered to reach out to some folks in the Maryland 500 first. So perhaps, if nothing else, I'll get a warm intro to the 501st um, here in Maryland. He also suggested I check out the Black Series of Helmets, which I, I have seen. It's a sort of a – it's a high-quality uh, replica version that you can buy. It's widely available. I would imagine the hardcore people probably poo-poo it as being <laughs> not – precise enough but it's certainly a step up from what you could get from a toy store for example or, right you know. it's too we, even, uh, warrior. we even tagged the 501st legion on twitter in our update so i was hoping that might get some traction but maybe it got flagged as inciting violence oh wait that wasn't <laughs> us well and it's all i mean admittedly it's a strange time to make the request because yes. what are we going to do you know it's not like they'll say <laughs> oh we have a car. parade <laughs> yeah, we have a parade this weekend. Come on and join us. And so there's not a whole lot they probably could do even if they wanted to. So uh, that's that's part of the reality of it. But I don't know. I, I, I hold out hope. It'll it'll happen sooner or later. Someday it will happen. Yes. If ha- even if I just have to start buying it one piece at a time and just assembling my own you know, this slippery slope. This is how it starts, right? <laughs> this is how it starts. Well, Dave, mm-hmm. you know, for Christmas this year, we will send you the cod piece. <laughs> <laughs> just, start, just start wearing it around in public. That would be hilarious. <laughs> uh, you can't mix and match with the furry head we sent you for Christmas, though. That oh, why be, not? Oh. Don't ruin the fun. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> <laughs> I just I was thinking they might clash. That's all. Yeah. Hmm. They're both white. Oh, true. <laughs> true. True. <laughs> okay, point taken. Yeah. Well, yeah. just don't wear them after Labor Day. <laughs> right. Well, I, I'm not an animal. I mean, come on. <laughs> Everybody has their backup TIE fighter po- costume yeah. for that. <laughs> exactly. Right. Exactly. Exactly. All right. Well, guys, hang in there. Uh, yep. This. This too shall pass, and uh, may the wheel rise for you next week. Dave. <laughs> there yes. you go. There you go. All right. I'll talk to you guys soon. I really miss sports ball, Jason. I know uh, you do. I've got a bit. I've got a bit of sports ball related news. 
Dodger Stadium has now become the largest coronavirus testing site in California. Yay, Woo! sports ball. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dodger Stadium, which has hosted nearly 20 million fans over the past five seasons, has opened as the largest coronavirus testing facility in the state of California, with the capacity to test 6,000 people daily, according to our Mayor Eric Garcetti. Uh, on Tuesday, tests will be conducted from the stadium parking lot with large video monitors explaining the process in hopes of maximizing efficiency. And I have to say, if there are large video monitors explaining the process in the parking lot, this would be the first time the parking lot might actually be efficient. And it's one of the worst true. parking lots <laughs> in the fucking world. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, and uh, continuing with some sports ball news, it is the Women's Soccer League, but it is still a major soccer league, and it is only the second soccer league or even major sports league in the world to announce an actual return date. The Bundesliga is already playing, but the Women's Soccer League will return in June, June 27th to be exact. Uh, so the National Women's Soccer League, which includes 23 members of the 2019 World Cup winning U.S. Women's Soccer Team, will play a one-month tournament to be held entirely in Utah. Uh, we don't know how many people are going to actually participate in turn because some, you know, I mean, it's the Women's Soccer League, a lot of kids, a lot of concerns. Yeah. And um, yeah, so and we also don't know. Uh, if there will be fans, I'm assuming not, and uh, they're doing it smart by having it in one location, so there's not a lot of travel. So I will be watching. That will be fun. And uh, yay, sports ball. Please come back sooner well, rather than later. <laughs> and I, I saw this one yesterday, and uh, I've, i got to put the link in the show notes, but uh, Japan is working with uh, Yamaha, and they've mm. got a new app that they have. It's for remote cheering. For your team. So they put speakers all around the stadium and everybody watching has an app and they can cheer from the app to at least get the, you know, I the, love the that atmosphere. Idea. I love yeah. that idea because what Fox has started doing with the Bundesliga is they're putting in canned audience noise and it's horrific. Right. It's stupid. Yeah. Yeah. So Yamaha just basically they put these speakers around there. You have an app with different options on it. And as your team plays, you're watching it live. You can send in, you know, live feedback to the actual players, which is a fantastic idea. I so, wonder if they have filters so you can't go, hey, yeah, you stupid idiot. <laughs> <laughs> what are you blind ref? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's very funny. That is very cool. I wish I wish if we're going to do this for a long time, I'd much rather have that than the canned bullshit that they're putting in right now. Definitely. But, you know, I still think it's cool that you can hear everybody. I, I like that part. Oh, but I, I guess it, it but doesn't that's, really. Yeah, that, they're, they're, well, you know, they're gearing up for the U.S. sports because like I talked about, um, you know, uh, athletes tend to use ribald language, as it yes. were. So if we can drown that out with fake audience, that's what we're going to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, All right. Well, there you go. Until next time, I'm Brian Schulmeister. And I'm Jason DeFilippo. Thanks for listening to Grumpy Old Geeks. To support the show and keep us on the air, go to GOG.show slash donate. Toss us a few bucks and we'll love you forever. And if you still want to get those masks, because it looks like we're going to be wearing them for a long time, go to GOG.show slash shop. Your support really keeps us going and we really appreciate it. Show notes for this episode are at GOG.show slash 443. From there, you can find links to old episodes, leave feedback, ask questions, donate to the show, and get links to stuff we like. Stay grumpy and try not to set anything on fire today. <laughs>